Well, welcome to week five of Seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. I'm Dr. Joel Mutamali, and this is my dear friend, Lisa Turkhurst. And this week, we're talking about uh, protections, about That's right. the protection of God. But more specifically, we're going to also look at um, seeing Jesus in the midst of our fears and anxieties. Um, Lisa, there's so many moments that we have in life that are riddled with fear and riddled with anxiety. And one of the things that gives me such great comfort in Scripture is that God was so good that he didn't hide those from us. He's so honest, you know, and he gives us pictures and examples all throughout the Scripture of the people of God that have experienced the very same thing. Um, one of the most important, I think, I say this a lot about a lot of stories, but I think one of the most important stories uh, specifically about the people of Israel is the story of Israel and the Red Sea. Um, it is a moment, if there is a descriptor of fear and anxiety for the mm-hmm. Israelites, this is one of them. And I want to point out a few details. So let's turn to Exodus chapter 14. Um, one, I want us to see that there's nothing random that takes place. Um, when it comes to God and his purposes. And so in verse 17, Exodus 13, actually, verse 17, this is what um, we find. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and they'll return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Now, this goes on. We're going to look at chapter 14 in more detail, but ultimately what's taking place is God intentionally leads the people of Israel all the way to the Red Sea, knowing that Pharaoh is going to be close behind them. Mm -hmm. And what seems like a dead end is actually going to be a moment for God to actually show his supremacy and his power and his might. Now, Lisa, we've done a lot of... ultimate protection and his right? ultimate protections. Yeah. Lisa, we've done a lot of study uh, throughout the Old Testament, but when I say the sea, what do you think of when I say the sea? Well, I would love to say when we see the sea mentioned in the Bible that it's just this beautiful, <laughs> calm, you know, like a day by the sea, like, you know, the seagulls and the shells and kids laughing and playing in the waves. But actually when we see the sea, In scripture, it really is a sign of chaos and absolute danger. And I love what you pointed out, Joel, because there was no easy path for the Israelites. And I think sometimes we think, why in the world would God have the Egyptians behind them and the Red Sea in front of them? Like why? I mean, surely there was another route and there was, and it was actually a shorter route. But God knew that the Philistines would strike such fear in mm-hmm. the hearts of the people that they would run back to Egypt. And so I think this is pointing out something that in life, just like Jesus says in the New Testament, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Yeah. In other words, I think there's going to be many situations in our life where there's no perfect path. There's no absolute easy way to get through whatever it is that the Lord is leading us through. Yeah. And so I think one thing, if, if we want to really see the, the description of the sea in Scripture, where it, it is likened to a treacherous enemy, yeah. um, we can turn over to Jeremiah chapter 6, starting in verse 23. It says, They are armed with bow and spear. They are cruel and show no mercy. They sound. So this is the enemy of the Israelites. This is this is the enemy that that the the sound of the enemy is this. They sound like a roaring sea Hmm. as they ride their horses. They come like men in battle formation to attack you, daughter Zion. So so many times we could go through lots of other scriptures too, where the sea was a symbol of chaos and possible destruction so imagine the israelites feelings okay there and like i said there's no obvious good path every path feels scary to them for the israelites god delivered them but at this moment they had an enemy behind them yes they got out of egypt and god answered their prayer and he delivered them but the egyptians are now chasing them so the egyptians are behind them the chaos and the danger 
possible destruction, maybe even death, of the sea is in front of them. So it's almost like they're caught. I know you've probably heard the saying, between a rock and a hard place. place. I mean, this is just a very scary situation. And I understand this because I felt this way before. I felt like I was in the middle of if I go back, it's terrible. If I go forward, it's terrible. And so I asked the question, Jesus, where are you now? Yeah. And the big question is, how are you going to protect me? Mm -hmm. How are you going to take care of me? Is there a way out that isn't going to cost something from me? And so, Joel, I have this question. Okay, we're talking about seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. And so where is the presence of Jesus here in this Red Sea story? Yeah, so this is really important. Let's look at a couple more verses in Exodus 14 that will help us to see Jesus pretty clearly. Exodus 14, starting in verse 14 the, this is what Moses says to the Israelites. He says, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. Which I think that verse on its own is incredibly powerful. But basically what Moses says to the Israelites is, hey, by the way, everything you experience from this moment on, you have to remember that none of this is anybody else's doing except the Lord's doing. And this is evidence that the Lord is fighting for you. Then this is where we actually see the presence of Jesus in the Old Testament. Verse 19, then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So again, think of this image, the images of sea uh, and death in front and Egyptians and death behind. And what is the enemy, death and Pharaoh coming from behind? Literally, the angel of the Lord goes from before them and goes to their backside. Now, in military language, it's called the flank. The the place behind you is the weakest place that you have. Mm. And this is where the, the angel of the Lord goes. And this is where the pillar of the cloud goes. And verse 20 says this, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness and it lift up the night without one coming near the other all night. We know the end of the story that the Red Sea parts Mm -hmm. and the Israelites go through the Red Sea to the promised land on the opposite side. But the other very important part of the story is that the Egyptians actually follow them into the Red Sea Mm -hmm. and the sea actually collapses onto them. Mm -hmm. In our study, we've looked at this angel of the Lord figure and we've actually made, I think, a compelling reason to say actually the angel of the Lord can be likened to the pre-incarnate Messiah, Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. And so here's the presence of Jesus who's there. But here's something even more incredible. This is setting an anticipation, an expectation for the people of Israel, that in the same way that God saved Israel from an image of death, the sea, and, and actually brought order to chaos by parting the Red Sea and letting the people go through, the the Egyptians themselves have died in the sea. Death has somehow defeated death. What happened at the cross? Mm. Jesus goes on to the symbol of death. And through his own death, he defeats death itself. This is a greater enemy than Pharaoh, than the Assyrians and the Babylonians to come, than Rome. This is the ultimate enemy. The ultimate power that has the ability to to put crippling anxiety and fear in the hearts Mm. of humanity. The fear of death. And who is victorious over it? The Messiah. Jesus himself, who comes between us and the enemy, who separates it so that even though we pass through death, on the other side, we don't have to fear it. And on the other side, we meet Jesus. And so I know we've turned to Hebrews 2 before, (laughs) but of course I have to go back. And obviously Hebrews 2 is in the New Testament, but I think this is going to connect New Testament to Old Testament. What you're saying is that Jesus is there because he's the one that provides the buffer between us and death and between the Israelites and the Egyptians, right? And so listen to Hebrews chapter 2 again, starting in verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, Jesus, so Mm -hmm. by Jesus's death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. And who holds the power of death? 
That is the devil, the enemy. And free those who all their lives, verse 15, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And I think it's so powerful when we bring the Old Testament and make the connection of the New Testament and we see Jesus so clearly through it all. Well, as you study seeing Jesus through the different protections this week, I pray that you have a deep revelation of Jesus being the very protection. Maybe you don't see it. Maybe you don't even see evidence of it, but you can stand in the assurance that Jesus is there between you and the enemy. And he was there in scripture in that way, and he's there in that way in our lives as well.